But um, if, if you want, Monty, we can get started yeah. on um, just the, what we've been doing for um, AAPI Heritage Month, which is fantastic. It was Monty and Trevani and AQIA uh, came to us and just talked about um, collaborating on something and panels to do for um, AAPI Heritage Month. So um, Monty, do you want to um, talk about like what we're aiming for? Yeah, sure. So through the series, we wanted to highlight the amazing queens out there in within animation. So um, today we're talking to off these awesome show owners and directors in the industry. And um, yeah, I think we can begin what, by um, by having introductions. So I can I'll pass it on to Alice, and then you can popcorn it to someone else. Popcorn it. We were just talking before, and I <laughs> never heard that term before, but I like it. Popcorn, popcorn. It's like pops over to someone else. Okay. Yes. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm Alice Sue. Uh, I am currently directing a feature animated film at Netflix Animation called Steps um, with Amy Poehler, Ricky Lindholm, Kate McCucci, uh, a wonderful team at Netflix. Uh, and I'm really honored to be here with uh, Kat and Christine, Monty, Bobby. So, so honored to be here with you all. Um, yeah, and uh, I guess uh, let's see, my parents are from Taiwan, my grandparents are from China, uh, they came here during grad school, I grew up, um, I was born and grew up in the U.S., uh, and um, yeah, uh, I'll popcorn it to Christine. Hi, hi, I'm Christine Sanko, um, I am a writer, I was on a lot of things, I was on Kipo and the Age of Wonder Bees. I was a co-EP on Jurassic World Camp Cretaceous. I've been at, I was at Nickelodeon on Fanboy and Chum Chum and Mighty B and Fairly Odd Parents and Tough Puppy and then My Little Ponies. And now I'm about to be a showrunner for a show that has not been announced yet, so I can't talk about it, but a DreamWorks show. <laughs> nice, nice, congratulations. Thank you. And um, yeah, I'm from Diamond Bar. My parents are from the Philippines. They came here in the 70s and uh, lived in Jersey for a while before <laughs> moving out to West Covina and then Diamond Bar. Um, and yeah, popcorn cat. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, my name is uh, Katana Vadani. Um, if I say it in a correct pr pronunciation, it's Katana Vahdani. And um, I was born uh, in Iran, um, uh, got my degree in mathematics. Um, we moved to US and I followed uh, animation. I've been working at Disney for many years and uh, I am lucky enough to be part of Netflix's team with Alice, and uh, I am currently uh, a director creator of an original feature at Netflix, which I can't um, say further because it hasn't uh, been announced yet. But um, yes, I'm grateful to be here among you, wonderful people. Awesome. Thank you, Kat. I appreciate yeah, it. Amazing. Do I have popcorn to? Bobby or to someone? <laughs> I'm the last one. I keep the popcorn. No, <laughs> if anything, you can popcorn to Monty. I keep popcorn. Everyone, <laughs> everyone's so everyone's tired of hearing me talk. Monty, <laughs> you can go, Monty. Monty's Monty is some. Oh, like for the uh, next question or for introduction? <laughs> uh, introduction. Then we can pop into next question. Oh sure. So hi everyone. If you don't know who I am, my name is Monty, and um, I'm actually a student. So I graduate towards the end of this um, month. And I'm um, job hunting like a lot of you out there. <laughs> so um, yes, it's, it's been good. It's been good. And, I, oh, and also I want to be in production management to be a producer someday. So yeah. Yeah. Uh, and I can get it off, uh, get started with the, um, with the uh, questions, if you guys don't mind. Sounds good. I'm getting into it. Um, so now that you've told us a little bit about yourselves, um, I just, I guess I wanted to know, um, growing up in your household, you know, us, you know, kind of, um, kind of being from, uh, you know, like households that traditionally maybe, um, um, are seen where like art is maybe isn't necessarily the most successful path or it may most straightforward path. So, 
um, what was it like growing up in these sort of households, whether, you know, it's Iranian, like Chinese or Filipino, um, and wanting to get into a creative space and going, mom, dad, I want to be a storyteller. I want to work in movies. That kind of, was it a challenging thing for you growing up? Um, we can start with a uh, cat if you want. Um, thank you. Actually, it's a great question. I, um, so, you know, uh, if any Iranian, uh, Iranians are watching, I know Roya, I just uh, saw your beautiful name. Uh, uh, you know, in Iran, um, I have to say education is so important because especially for women, because this is almost like our way of having a voice. Uh, and um, so uh, growing up in my household, uh, again, going uh, to school, in fact, uh, they changed my birthday for me to go to school even earlier. And, uh, but, uh, so I, uh, in Iran, they normally, they say, you know, study mathematics or, uh, you know, or, or be a lawyer and art is not, um, I, I assume many people would re re relate here in regards to our past is not really upfront. Like it's in America that I feel like art is really, you can have a career, uh, but hopefully things are changing around the world. So that being said, um, I followed the mathematic journey and um, my mother was always into art. She's an architect. And so just watching her, I was always mesmerized. I remember um, one of the first book they gave me was Goodbye Pick Picasso, which was, I, I again, I didn't know in English, I was uh, four years old and I was just flipping through all of it. So I was exposed to art. And again, the Persian culture is a culture of poetry and, and um, just full of art. But again, um, things are different nowadays um, in regards to the priorities. So I uh, got my degree in math, but my heart was in art. So Anyone who uh, knows me in Iran, I went to school Tisushan, if you guys, uh, if Iranians know, but uh, I used to always like draw on the blackboard, like somewhere like in the corner. So, um, and I used to dream uh, about Walt Disney. I thought he's alive. I was like, wow, like I want to be like him one day. So uh, just growing up in the household, I say, I was, um, you know, I had access to art and of course, and I, we watched animation channel, but very limited. We had three channels at that time in Iran, but I had a big dream and uh, I was lucky enough that my parents uh, never stopped me of uh, believing I can uh, pursue art, but they always said, okay, just, you know, do the math, do all that, but then, things changed once we came to America and that's that's a whole different journey. Uh, so I will just leave it at that, that hey. um, I think the yeah. parents allowed me to be exposed, yes. That's wonderful. I love hearing that. I love hearing that. Um, you want popcorn it? I can popcorn it. Yeah, <laughs> sure. <laughs> Let's keep this thing going. Uh, Alex? Sure. Um, yeah, no, I, I relate. You know, I remember it's like you, you feel what's, you realize what was truest to you when you like go back to what you wanted to do when you were like four, you know, like when I was like in kindergarten and they asked me what I wanted to do, I was always like an artist. But I think over time, you know, like I was saying, there are expectations. Like it went from artist to, oh, I see like every, seeing my parents make all these decisions to kind of best prepare me for academic success. So it was like, you know, everything had to be contributing to some sort of achievement, whether that was like Kuma math or Chinese school or like learning three different instruments or never spending a summer, you know, wasted with play. <laughs> like it was always like a summer camp that was um, kind of academic and, and always kind of feeling some pressure to kind of have an achievement that you can show, right? Like have a measure of success that you can show like a score or something on a paper or an award or a trophy. I think eventually when I was in even as young as middle school, my dream was no longer like artist. It was like um it was I don't I didn't I don't even know. I think I was actually really confused about what I wanted to be because if it wasn't an artist then what did I want to be? Um and I feel like 
but I knew that it wasn't an artist. I think like from a young age, I knew that I couldn't because I had a responsibility, like a financial responsibility to my family to be able to grow up and support them. And that stayed with me for a long time. Like even once I got into college, I chose not art, but like architecture. Um, and I, I, rem I saw like Roya was saying, how both her parents are artists because it's funny, both my parents were in design related fields as well. And there was still that pressure because I think they would share how difficult it was um, and how unstable it felt and that they wanted me to in some ways do better by like, you know, going into medicine or law or uh, even business because it felt like more stable than art. And eventually I decided to major in architecture. Um, and found out that it doesn't really, like no industry is a guarantee in terms of stability, um, no matter how much like science or engineering or whatever, you know, like the myth that, that it involves. Um, so, so, you know, like looking back, I'm like, I should have just very early on <laughs> pursued my passion, but I'm also very thankful for the journey I've been on. And I will also say that my parents, even though they strongly nudged me a certain direction, still very much like accepted that I wanted this when I really made that decision. So I'm very grateful for them. I will popcorn into Christine. Um, I didn't know that I wanted to be a writer at first, but like you were saying, like looking back at my childhood, I was always writing, but like I thought I wanted to be Leia Salonga. So, <laughs> which did not happen, but um. It wasn't until, like, I actually, well, growing up, <clears throat> my parents just always pushed to do well in academics in general and, you know, were supportive of, like, I wanted to be in choir, I wanted to be in band, and I did all that stuff, but in general, they were like, I, you know, I totally have, I call it Asian A syndrome, where I feel so excited that I got an A, and my mom would be like, but why isn't it an A plus? <laughs> 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 so I had that. But um, grateful for the, I guess, the worth, the work ethic that that instilled in me <laughs> to just like always try to impress them. Um, and I actually went to college thinking I was going to do communications. And I took one uh, TV film class and was like, ooh, I want to do this instead. And uh, within that, I went to Cal State Fullerton. They didn't have concentrations. You just kind of generally majored in radio, TV, film. So my degree says radio, which tells me, tells you how old I am. <laughs> but <laughs> you learn a little bit of everything, which was nice because I, I mean, I know how to do After Effects and I know how to edit. But in doing all that, I figured out that writing was what I wanted to do. And um, my dad actually, he wanted to be a journalist, but he ended up being a stockbroker because he was the first generation here and that was the more stable thing to do. So I kind of had him in my corner in that like, he's like, oh, you want to be a writer? Okay, go ahead. <laughs> um, and my mom was a little bit harder to convince. She's the one who like down to when I was a month away from graduating, like within four years with like honors, she was like, but are you sure you don't want to be a nurse? Oh. <laughs> well, I can't change it now. <laughs> it's all out of concern. And like you guys were saying, yeah. you know, the stability and the, yeah. them just not really knowing. Yeah. I mean, it is a tough industry. It is, and I totally understand where the concern is coming from, but mm -hmm. just kind of had to push through it. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah. Yeah, I mean, man, I can relate to that because like even in, you know, uh, when I was coming in to tell uh, an Asian parent that you want to be an artist, like there's, no, I mean, that I remember my mom telling me her only vision was like me painting in malls, landscapes and portraits at parks and that kind of stuff. And it's like, hey, nothing, <laughs> nothing against that. But like, I, I think there's a... Uh, uh, there's architecture in that kind of, I hadn't even heard of animation by that point, but like, um, yeah. Um, but yeah, it, I, all that to say that um, the concern, I, I felt like looking back is valid. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like it's, it's a little bit valid. It's yeah, it's like valid, it's a valid concern and I get it. I get it, I get it. 
but you know, back then we didn't have anything like animation to like, you know, like to offer them or take a look at this and like how people are making a living, that kind of stuff. So um, anyway, uh, I guess yeah. I'll for that. Yeah. And I actually had a question. Um, it wasn't in the prepared question, but I came inspired by our conversation, mm -hmm. which was um, when was the moment like during your career that you realized this is like, wow, this is what I want to do for the rest of my life. Was it like a project or was there a moment? Uh, yeah, feel free to describe how that was. I can share a moment where I knew I didn't want to stay in the industry I was in. So I did work in architecture for a short while. <laughs> it was like surprisingly short. It was like a year, but it was like a, a cushy. I was like very, you know, privileged to have that job. It was the middle of the recession. It was like, you know, my peers were not as, some of them were not as lucky. And so I was in a very nice position in, you know, midtown Manhattan and, uh, but it was really tough, of course, um, you know, we're staying early, early hours uh, in the morning, kind of like doing like laser, laser cutting and like building models and stuff. Um, and I was like, there was a moment where I was like, do I want to stay in this industry? Because if I do, then I need to decide because I, I would then, it's kind of like going into you know, medicine or law, but not as, you know, but, but it is like, you would have to go get your master's and you would, you know, uh, have to get, take your exams for licenses. And it would just be the next 10 years of my life if I wanted to stay. And I actually looked at like the person at that company that was at the very top, you know, this was the president of the architecture company. And I was like, do I want to do what he does? You know, like, is that the bar that I'm reaching for, you know? And it was interesting because I saw his day in day out, like he would fly in to like the roof of the building on a helicopter and it was all like very, you know, bougie and like met with really important people, but he didn't really get a chance to be that creative. Like you're still ultimately designing buildings and that's very admirable. But I realized that I was like, they don't tell clear enough stories for me. <laughs> like I knew that I really wanted to tell stories. And of course, you know, you walk through a building, it is telling a story, but I was like, I don't think he gets to do that. And would I want to spend the next 10 years of my life, not even quite getting there, but like getting to like midway <laughs> there, or maybe even the beginning of the way there. And I was like, I think I want to be creative like a lot sooner. And that was what prompted me to go back to like my like four-year-old self. And was like, if I had to wipe this slate clean and go back to the drawing board, like what do I have the most passion in? And that, um, that was art. That was like all the animated movies. That was storytelling, you know, that was what I loved um, growing up. So, yeah. Um, I want to just, uh, you know, um, to, to answer your question, um, you see, in um, I want to be like uh, gentle the, the the way I describe it because there's so much misunderstanding from the stories we hear from this side of the planet and the other. So your question is at what moment uh, you know I knew that this is wow this could be something. This is actually before coming uh, to America. Um, you know, in uh, the other side of the planet, you hear, as I said, different sides of the stories. And uh, and if I would stay uh, on the other side, uh, I would have thought of a lot of you on this side very differently. And this has, this is because of the stories that they tell us. And, and I feel on this side is the same thing, uh, as much as we deny it, the stories that we grew up here from people on the other side and certain things were exposed, we view them very differently. So for me, the moment was there was one day, um, uh, again, uh, you know, you can tell my age too, like we were watching VHS and again, watching certain animation was illegal at that time in Iran. Um, and so we had a chance, we had a VHS that was recorded in the theater illegally of Iron Giant. And uh, me and my brother, none of us knew English. Uh, he was five years old, four or five years old. And uh, we were watching it and I was, uh, I'm 10 years older than him. And suddenly the moment, I don't wanna expose the ending, but the ending scene, um, for those who haven't seen Iron Giant, please do. Um, 
my brother started sobbing and I was sobbing and none of us knew English. And at that moment, um, for me, I knew the power of visual storytelling. And one thing I said early on, I, I, I never thought I could come to America, but, but I was like with visual storytelling, you can change things. And those things very much exist. If I tell you what has happened in my childhood at the schools, the marches we've been on and all that, it's, but uh, I have nothing but love now. And I believe the thing that can truly unite both sides is the visual storytelling. So I think that moment uh, was a moment I knew there's something much more powerful than any weapon, any atomic bomb, any anything that they say, I have more power. It's the stories, especially visual storytelling, that it's the most universal language. So that's when I knew. And then when I got the opportunity that to come to America, which is th that was uh, very much luck, um, I asked my mother, I said, can I take this seriously? I want to make a difference with uh, visual storytelling. And, and I, my mother is a warrior, I always call. And, uh, she she sort of put wind under my wings and I just flew in America. Mm -hmm. So awesome. Um, I kind of have a two-part answer, which is my first job that I was paid for <laughs> was on the Mighty Bee as an assistant. And um, that was that was Amy Poehler's show. And it was kind of this rare thing where for the first season there were the whole writer's room was women. There were three writers and it was like an all women writer or all female writer's room. And I remember sitting in on like, just breaking a story, just a normal day and seeing what that was like and being like, oh my God, if this was my life every day, I would be so happy. And that was when I was like, okay, I really have to like, you know, try because at the time I was like really like a newbie and too nervous to even like participate <laughs> or anything. So that's the moment that I knew I wanted to do this, but it wasn't until much later that I knew that I could be good at this, <laughs> which was when I was in another, like the next room that I went to um, was, I was the only girl and it was just like all guys. And it was like, I think it was just like, I don't even remember what it was specifically, but the first time that I made that whole room laugh and someone was like crying and it was like people from all of, like this was just like people who could not be more different from me. <laughs> and, you know, how to have that response. I was like, okay, maybe have a shot at being good at this if I keep doing this kind of a thing. How did you, how did you, how do you think, Christine, you came over that sort of like, uh, the anxiety and fear or is it just a matter of like doing it day in day out you just have to keep trying I think that like there's for a lot of writers because the room is such a it's such a beast and you're in your head the whole time and every time I talk to a new writer this is always the experience where you're just in your own head like evaluating every little thing that you said and like whether or not someone laughed and if I say something again like I haven't talked in an hour I have to say something kind of a thing you're constantly thinking about that and you just have to keep going and get past that and also keep in mind that like you're the only one who's thinking that no one else is keeping score like you're as much as you're in your own head everyone is either in their own head or they just are focused on the job. So, yeah. And also remembering, someone once told me that um, people will remember when you pitch something good and they won't really remember all the times you pitch something bad. <laughs> all your I'm answers are so beautiful. <laughs> um. But no, that's a great segue too, of just like Christine, you shared what it was like in the room when you were the only like female there or like a uh, person of color. Has that also been like a, a factor in your career? And then we can, we can, we can sort of 
and the popcorn tourists as a panel as well on just kind of like being a minority like in these rooms as well and you know if you had that kind of what pressures you kind of felt I think yeah um so I have a writing partner who is another lady Joanna Lewis uh so I've never been the only uh, aside from that one job when I when I was the script coordinator and that was before we partnered up I've never been the only woman in the room mm -hmm. I have I am usually the only Asian person or person of color and it you do feel it to be super honest like especially when you're on a show where there is an Asian character and anytime someone like pitches anything remotely Asian related or something from that character you just kind of feel that they're waiting for your response <laughs> so or you know sometimes there are the questions like oh is this like, can we do this? And I'm like, I can't speak for all of the Asian community, but as the only Asian person here, like I can say this. And it's also, it's tough because for the most part, um, in the beginning of your career, like you don't feel comfortable telling them no, because you don't want to be the no police and the person who's just like, you know, you're still there trying to prove that you belong there. So to kind of shoot something down, you kind of were like, I don't want to be that person. So like now, totally, I'll just tell you. <laughs> um, but yeah, there's definitely that pressure. I think it's getting better, but when you're the only, you feel it. Yeah, yeah. Um, Alice, do you have any thoughts on on those kind of feelings, being in the room? Yeah, um, so I think from my perspective, I spent many years kind of pitching and um, kind of trying to land a, a leadership role like directing. And, you know, there were, I was never necessarily the only woman on a team, often like Christine, the only Asian woman sometimes on a team. Um, but I had been in positions where I had interviewed uh, for a senior, more senior position, like, like, you know, on the creative team of a film and it had like a female protagonist or something and they needed, like you could tell when I went into the room, like there was one, there was one studio that was like very clear that they just needed a woman, you know, like they, they needed a woman, but everyone else had like leagues more experience than me. Um, and it was, you know, ultimately I didn't get it. So I was wondering if it was like, oh, and I don't think they ended up hiring a woman. So it was like, oh. did they just do that to like say that they interviewed women and then couldn't find the right fit, you know? Um, and there was another uh, job that I interviewed for where they, you know, it was like a big experience, kind of like a recognizable name that was ahead of a project. and. Um, it was a senior team of all men, like writers and, you know, producers and exec producers. And it was a female protagonist that they said they wanted to be really authentic. And I was pitching my version and it like occurred to him, like the, the lead person, like, oh, actually it might be really good to have a woman on this team. Like while I was in the room, <laughs> it was just mm -hmm. like, oh, like, I don't know. I think because for me, I'll, I'll be honest, like earlier on in my career, like in architecture, for example, like uh, this was, you know, gender and racial bias was not something that was top of mind for me. And so when I was the only woman or was, was the only Asian woman, I thought it was just normal in like a male dominated industry. So I kept my head down. By the time I got into animation, I was much more aware of when those things happened. And so when I experienced those things, I you know, I think it pushed me more and more to try to just like gravitate toward cultures that are accepting. And, you know, sometimes I feel like people might think, look, but this is a great opportunity. I should just do it. Like, to me, that is almost never the right answer. <laughs> like, like, I don't think I could do it, you know? And like, I've said no to opportunities that were um, offered to me when I've been in the room, like in the office and realized like, okay, I don't think this is the place that actually does prioritize, um, you know, great culture when it comes to women, women of color, especially. Uh, and 
you know, sometimes I feel like I think it's important to all of us. And I just want to encourage everyone to like have those standards for yourself. Like you can find those wonderful work environments and places that treat you with respect. That's what it's all about. Yeah. Um, uh, thank you. Um, I, I feel like, uh, you know, even before I um, came to the industry, um, so when we came to America, um, I, I had my degree, so I went to CalArts when I was 16 and a half, and I remember I knew barely any English. I had a tape recorder. I would go there, and I was the only, uh, you know, Middle Eastern girl at CalArts, and I remember just, uh, you know, everyone had been, I have to say, for me, my experience uh, in California, I should say, uh, people were extremely, um, welcoming actually, or at least the people that I came across. Um, uh, but that feeling of being the only person, uh, I think from the moment I came to America and going to Valencia at that time, CalArts is in Valencia. And it, uh, you know, again, uh, at that time there was like nobody from Middle East and um, I was the only Middle Eastern in the character animation department. And later on coming to the industry, um, I remember at Disney feature, which was my biggest dream. I, um, I was among, uh, it was a trainee session and I was among uh, all boys. And uh, the moment I really realized that I'm, um, I, I actually started using my voice. I wasn't shy to not use my voice. And then I got punished for it. And then I was like, oh, wait a minute. Maybe I shouldn't use my voice. Uh, was a, a Disney feature that I um, talked about uh, the movie Tangled that uh, why you have a girl who wants to be free all her life and she gets saved by a man and Two, two seconds later, she falls in love and gets married. She should say no, she should go explore the world. And I think my perspective coming from a woman from Iran who is like, I want to have a voice. And I think that's where, but then I realize they're like, we've worked on it for 10 years, the reason. So anyhow, I uh, soon realize uh, that, uh, you know, certain um th that i am the only one you know and and perhaps my perspective at that time felt like i am the only one uh later on i've been told by people that hey uh you have an accent like a lot of times the accent also made me f like people look they think you're stupid if you have an accent and if you say like oh i have a math degree and i can speak four other languages and the moment they hear that you have an accent in English they're like this person perhaps is not an educated person so I um in the industry I've I remember I was the only Persian at that time in in one of the uh I don't want to name what company but uh a, a company and, and and I was working for production and then they literally would say you're Persian we don't understand you so uh, but anyhow Times are different. This is a new day, um, and uh, we are opening doors for others. And truly, uh, Netflix is one of a kind. Not advertising for Netflix, but I have, <laughs> I have a soft uh, like place for Netflix because they they are truly speaking with action. So um, they are they do prioritize what we're talking about with a really supportive, inclusive environment. So that's true. <clears throat> yeah, and I will say, like Cat, I I. I don't understand why people think when POC are biling bilingual, it's not like a talent, but when non-POC are bilingual, it's like, oh my God, you can speak more than one language. <laughs> yes. And I'm just like, what do you mean? Thank it's you. Hard yeah. That's <laughs> tough. Like my Chinese right now is like not good. <laughs> like, you know, I can't really, I don't even know if I can really say I'm bilingual, you know? So being as good as you are Kat, at both languages, that's impressive. Oh, I'm not as good as, but like, Alice knows my English. Like, Alice actually no, it's helps me a lot, like, with English. I have to say, no, I'm, I'm learning from all of you guys. Uh, but um, thank you. I mean, again, you know, I, I, I just say um, what I'm so grateful is when I've been among 
you, you know, everyone, Bobby, Alice, like the way we all lift each other up, you know, and I think that's what it's all about. So um, I know it is like, it seems like it is, I, I don't like to say trend. Maybe there's a scar in me that I'm like, now it's trending that, hey, diversity. I hope it's actually something that is going to stay. It's not like a fashion thing that comes up and they're like, let's hire, you know, minorities. And then later on it switches. But I really think it is up to us to hold this standard. So, yeah. So thank you to all of you. 100%. Yeah. Yes. Awesome. And, oh, sorry. No, go ahead, Masi. Go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to ask the question. So uh, some of you described being the only person of color in a room. And I wanted to ask, in those moments where maybe you had a bad day or you were feeling alone, what motivated you to keep going and to keep growing within um, growing your career? Mm. And uh, Christine, you can go first and then popcorn it. <laughs> I actually don't know that I've had a moment where I've been like, this isn't like, maybe I shouldn't do this ever since because <laughs> I'm just like constantly doing something, even when I'm not being paid to write, like we're writing something. And I just, that has just been like the ethic for <laughs> as long as I literally started working. I interned at Nickelodeon and it just happened, I happened to get a job that started the day after I graduated so I kind of just like and I've had breaks there's like been months of breaks but there's still like a freelance here or there or something or an original something that I'm working on so like I feel like the drive to keep going is just but it's just there <laughs> because it has to be and then what you spoke to too earlier, Christine, of just kind of like being one of the only like um, um, person of color in the room, mm -hmm. you know, I, I, um, I told her whatever, you know, all that you were saying just earlier, I told her relate to all of that kind of stuff of like, even being in a room, even like this one, I'm just kind of like every, you second guess everything, you know, and um, especially when you, the example you gave of just kind of like, we're going to make them, there's a gag or a joke or something like that or story point and it's you know it touches on asian culture and you can feel the room like look at you <laughs> you, know, <laughs> you know but not look at you but look at you uh yeah. but i think i mean that i, I mean uh, you know uh, uh, and i don't mean this in a trivial way i th i think that takes a lot of gumption i think that it takes a lot of courage because I, I you know i you know when it's like one versus the room like I can't even imagine like how how you would muster up like a you know um I I mean I know you can you can come up with the answer but like uh you know just the the courage enough to keep silent I guess yeah I mean the truth is there were moments where like early on in my career I did stay silent and then as I like got more experience and like you know things have been changing like just you know, yep. <laughs> build up to being able to do that. Awesome. Yeah. Great. Awesome. Yeah. Um, oh, go ahead, Kat. No, please, Alice, go ahead, go ahead. I'll go after you. Um, you know, I, I feel like we did cover some kind of darker aspects of, of the industry, right? That, that there is prejudice and that there's maybe lack of diversity inclusion in certain places. But I will say, you know, so first of all, Christine, that is extremely admirable that you had the motivation and gumption to just continue on. I know that when I first moved to LA, because I kind of tried to take the path of, I'm going to focus on original work and building, I guess, like directorial skills and things and going to class for like writing and things like that, because that's not something that I learned in school, um, that I, I took like a really lonely path where I wasn't, so unlike you, beautiful queens, like I didn't kind of go to take the studio path. And so I, you know, wasn't necessarily at a Disney or DreamWorks. And, and I will say that that path, when you're not ready for it, and especially the way I was brought up to always seek external validation, to always have to tell people like, you know, I, you know, like be able to say on your LinkedIn, like you're working at some recognizable place that brought me to a very dark place. Like, I realized like I didn't have in some at 
at my lowest points, I didn't have the confidence. Like I don't, I didn't even know if what I was creating was good because I had so relied on the external validation that it was like, look, my reps weren't going to be the ones to kind of coddle me. They were going to tell me if something was bad. And in the beginning, when you're creating, things are just going to be bad. <laughs> so that's all I was getting. And I was, you know, sharing with my friends, but you know, like sometimes your friends are just kind of nice to you. So there wasn't, there wasn't like a, you succeeded or like, you know, like a grade or, you know, something. There was nothing, nothing, no manager being like, great job, excellent, whatever. It was very lonely. And I think, you know, what was so I, what I was so grateful about was there were people though that I met in the industry, like an exec, like a development exec that I had pitched to that like remembered me and that checked up on me and was like, you know what? I might not have like accepted your first pitch, but I see something in you, you know, you inspired me, like keep going. And they were so it's weird to have, have like developed those relationships with like a development exec rather than, I don't know, like a, another artist, but there were just as, as often as, you know, you got the no or you got the discouraging thing, there would be like this gem of a person. Um, and for me, it was a lot of women in the industry that made me realize there is actually a strong undercurrent of like-minded individuals that might not speak out in a meeting and be like, feminism or like you know like racial equality but like they they believe in that and they're allies and they're out there you know and I was lucky enough to be able to lean on the few that continued to like believe in me and inspire me so that I could claw my way out and like eventually realize that like I maybe I don't need that much external validation like maybe look I'm gonna just work on something that makes my heart sing and that's, you know, in the end, of course, it's a business, but most importantly, you've got to be passionate about what you're creating. And, um, and so, you know, it's still a continuous journey for sure. But yeah, I'm grateful for those people. Um, I want to actually talk about, um, like, this is, this is such an important question. And I know um, a lot of you guys listening and perhaps watch this later. So this is for you. Um, um, you know, uh, you see us um, and perhaps, you know, uh, Bobby and Mansi, you guys are so kind enough to call us queens. I think it is very important, uh, you know, at least I speak for myself. I want to share with all of you who are listening and watching that we didn't just decide to do art and became queens. All of us, you know, this whole struggle, like, and many of us, you know, I always say symbolically underneath it all, we have so many scars. And I want to um, share with you the low moments that if any of you guys are at that moment, I hope you would never be in those moments, but I want to share with you. Um, one thing is, you know, sometimes to reach your dream. Um, for me, you know, when I came to America and I knew that I wanted to pursue art, even though I said it to you like that, it wasn't just like I came to America, woohoo, Cal Arts, I'm coming in. Um, you know, I, again, coming to a, a country, they call, I call it the country of the dreamers, right? I didn't know any English. I, uh, we came with two suitcases and um, I remember I was working in a grocery store as a bagger and uh, I remember one shift I had six in the morning and my mother always taught me whatever position you have, do a damn good job at it. So I cleaned the toilets and I signed my name behind it and I had to go outside to push the carts. And that's why if you guys ever go to the grocery store, put the cart back into its place. Like that little act of kindness can help someone, can make that person's day. So I was gathering all the carts from the corners and pushing it back. And at that moment, I felt I am such a loser. In my country, regardless of all the things, but I could speak the language. I had friends and families and my root was connected to the ground. And, and I wasn't cleaning toilets. I, you know, I um, studied math and now I'm in the land of the free and I'm doing this. And um, 
And I, I'm, I'm not kidding you, that day at the lowest moment when I went home and uh, opened the mailbox, uh, there was a letter from CalArts. The for, first word was congratulations, which later someone translated for me. Um, and I just wanna say another point I want to say is sometimes we have all these dreams. Some of you are watching, you say, wow, look at all these so-and-so queens, they are, you know, like, look at Christine, look at Alice, look at Monsi, look at Bobby, look at all of you, look at Shervani, like, um, I'm not there. And I, and I say, you know, you have a dream of maybe the company's industry, whatever it is, but you know what is the toughest thing is when you reach your dream and you realize it's not what you thought it would be. <laughs> and where do you go there, right? So if you are knocking at the doors and the doors don't open, or if you go through the door and you realize, oh my God, what is, I, this is not what I thought. I was at that moment and what I'm going to share with you, it is raw, but it is about the lowest moment for me was when I, uh, you know, and this is not about the company, Disney, but this is about the politics of life, I say, right? The politics in the industry. I, I was away from home. I could not return back home. The dream wasn't what it seemed to be. And there was abuse of power that had that is in all industries, I must say. And uh, I was suicidal. And um, for, I know my students are here. I, I know you, I, I've seen some of you guys here. Um, so, um, wow, okay. Give me one second. I was actually a very tough teacher. So this is perhaps some people that like, this is new when they see me. Um, but I, I was lucky enough with the help of my mom and I happened to be a baby bird to learn to live another day. And even today we are maybe in your eyes, I, I am lucky enough to, among, to be among these queens. Um, the journey was tough. So if you are there, don't give up. Um, and my tears are not tears of sadness. It's that I, I want to say I see you. It is tough, but we are in this together. Oh, thank you, Pat. I, I I'm so sorry, guys. If but anyhow, this is especially for the students who are watching because it's it's tough. They want to come in. They want their dreams to come true, and it's tough. I I get it. I, th I, I mean, like from, from my vantage point, Kat, I, I think it's important to talk about like those, like the winding road and the struggle, right? Mm -hmm, true. But, um, and, and just to normalize that, you know, uh, this impo the, the things that you talked about too, the imposter syndrome, I just kind of to normalize that too, or just kind of like, um, I think exactly what you said of just kind of like, we have you, um, we have you all here and you guys have done so many amazing things, but it's, it's not like you said, you didn't come from Iran and come here and boom, boom, boom. It was like a real hustle struggle, just back breaking, uh, just like everything. So no one really talks about that. I, I think. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, we, I, uh, you know, so that's why I say if you are right now symbolically or literally cleaning a toilet, sign your name proudly on that door. And if you are, go to a public toilet and you actually see the name of someone, this happens in America, not in other countries, but uh, remember their name, whoever, you know, was there. And also, uh, you know, I, I want to say, um, because we talk about suicide, I just want to quickly say, if you or someone, I, I'm not, I'm going to, I'm not going to say the number, <laughs> you know, dial this number, uh, but I just want to say one thing, uh, I, I hope we all be kind to each, each other, that sometimes people say to those people who are going through a dark time that, hey, come on, get out, look at life, you're, let's say you're in America, look, you're, you should be so happy. 
when any of us go through that dark, dark time, it is, it, it's not like many of us were aware, like it's not like we want to be there, right? Um, so if you know someone who's in the dark, I say the best thing is to sit in the darkness with them. I keep saying this, this is so valuable. And, and this, this industry of animation, we all talk about like the names of Netflix and, and Disney and, and this show and that show and the title, we all are human underneath it all with pains of life, right? We all maybe miss home and feel grief. So um, if someone's going through darkness, sit with them. If you're going through a dark time, we sit with you. So I, I will leave it at that and I will put myself on mute for now. <laughs> yeah. That's beautiful, that. That's yeah. beautiful. beautiful. Oh my God. Uh, and I will say like just a little ad note is the way you said that when you're in America, people picture you living a certain life when it's really not. Um, even like when I used to live in India, I used to think, oh, I'm going to live this certain life. But then you come here and it's entirely different. Like you could be working, like selling ice cream and then people just being mad at you for no reason. <laughs> and then you're just like, people are like, oh, you're in America. You must be living like luxuriously and you're just like yeah <laughs> so I think that goes with the representation not only in um like people but also the way people are living and the lifestyles like even abroad they show certain types of lives when it's not that at all it's just someone's perspective of it and that's why we need more storytellers like you to tell sto like your story and then um to be able to encourage everyone else who's watching to come and be able to share their stories as well. So I just wanted to thank you for, um, for sharing everything. <laughs> thank you, Monsi. Beautiful. Um, and I, number six, Monsi? Uh, so I, 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 I kind of want to wonder, I've never answered this question myself as well. This is, might be a little bit of a thinker, but um, um, what, what would you give um, what advice would you give your younger self? Like your, yourself that is just graduating from art school. <laughs> what would you give Monty, uh, your Monty self? No, I'm just kidding, Monty. Just give me a hard time. Um, being a working professional for a long time and having those stripes. Um, and we were talking about how graduation can be sort of this, uh, you know, uh, anxious, um, exciting time, but very uncertain. Um, knowing what you know now, like what kind of advice would you give your younger self? Um, I think when I first was trying to make it, I thought a lot about what would sell or what other people would want versus like a story that I'd want to tell. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I would just do a lot of research and like, this is the kind of thing that's selling or this is what the trend is and, you know, all that kind of stuff. And it, like, it works out sometimes, but like now that I am in this place where I can try and like develop something that's based on actual experience or something that's like really near and dear to my heart, I'm like, oh my God, this feels so much more better. <laughs> the things that I was trying to do when you're, you know, chasing something in the beginning. I think, I mean, there's definitely that balance because you do like, unfortunately have to think a little bit business mindedly if you, and so that you have the luxury of being able to do those passion projects. But I think that, um, yeah, I just would have younger me to figure that out a little bit sooner <laughs> would have been nice. Like telling personal stories, is that what you mean? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Tell, yeah. Telling stories that matter to you versus like, oh, office comedies are what everyone's buying right now type of a thing. Got it. Yeah. Yeah. I have had similar experiences for sure. Like I, I totally relate to that because I think in the beginning, you know, I had an interesting trajectory because my short film in grad school got some attention and so I had reps from an early stage in my career and kind of before I knew like what I wanted to say you know there I love my manager by the way love you um but at the same time 
you know, the, that's what reps know best, right? Like representation and agents managers, like they know what sells and they're trying to kind of encourage you to, to present ideas that are, you know, really exciting in the industry. And what idea was exciting and probably still is exciting um, when I first got into, or when I first came into town, I guess was like, Pixar, like Pixar had set the bar for what animated concepts should be in feature animation. And so it had to be this like really snappy, smart log line, like, like two opposites kind of thing. Like, what if there was a rat who wanted to cook, you know, like, <laughs> like it would be like this really, you know, like, oh my gosh, like how could, it was an idea, like they wanted ideas that would make you feel like, how could nobody have done that before, you know, like, and so I just, like, pick my brain over just, like, snappy log lines that I didn't care about, you know, it was just, like, okay, what would, what would sell, what would sell, and then I think, you know, after a while, I've learned a similar thing where that specificity is universal, that if you lean into what you know, and only you know it, it is really fresh, and actually, like movies like, um, you know, Black Panther, like you, you could, you, you relate to it on, like the more, sometimes the more specific something is, like the more you can relate to it and the more universal it feels, because there will always be those big themes of family and belonging and friendship and love, whatever it is that, that will bring you in. Um, and, you know, I've had, that has been a journey for me too. I think maybe some Asian people in the Asian community can, can relate to this, but in the beginning, I wasn't pitching Asian protagonists because it was like, well, you know, like, why does this protagonist have to be Asian? Like, because everything that I absorbed as a kid growing up here was like, Asian wasn't cool. Like, you know, it was like, like I, um, you know, might as well pitch like a white protagonist. And when, I don't know. It's like when I realized that there was a lack and there were other people who inspired me to lean into that, to, to really, you know, pitch um, what I, what I know. And uh, it started to kind of be a personal journey of overcoming these obstacles of, Hey, like, it's okay. Like I had to, it was a journey to get there to be like, it's okay to lean into who I am um, and, and show the world like aspects of my culture and of, I don't know, being like a young woman that like, that hasn't been really reflected on screen before and that to the right people, at least the people you wanna work with, that is compelling. <laughs> so if you lean into what you love, you're gonna end up finding the people that embrace it. And those are the people, those are exactly the people you should be working with anyway. Awesome, that's great. Yeah, I love that. Um, I'm going to keep it, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm going to say like, um, I'm going to pivot it a little bit. I agree with everything uh, these queens have said, uh, you know, about authenticity, you know, saying the stories that are important and true to your heart. And also, now what I'm, uh, what I'm going to tell you, it's something, again, I, I've said it to my students over and over again, and it's, I, I share my mistakes uh, with you guys. And to the younger self of mine, I say, uh, read what you're gonna sign, you know, and if you don't understand it, have someone who will explain it to you. So I know there are a lot of young people here who are so passionate to get in. You gotta also protect your rights as well. And that is very, very important. And another thing I, I tell it to the younger self of mine, you know, when graduated is um, there is a certain etiquette and politics, let's say, that they don't teach you at school. It's always about art. And I mean, I think it should be about art and stories. But if you don't know how to, uh, you know, uh, again, I always compare it to the Game of Thrones. You know, it is the Game of Thrones in the industry as well, and, and believe it or not. So I was very naive going in thinking, oh, it's just about like my story and I'm gonna go into the story room and tell everyone what, and uh, if you create enemies early on, like good luck with that, you know? Like, so there's one thing to get into the industry. There, there's another thing to hold on to your career to last long, right? And that really comes with make sure you don't ruin your reputation. And for that, you need to know the uh you know the aspects of truly being a warrior again i 
learned it by making mistakes. And I was very lucky that I survived uh, to, to this extent. So, um, you know, one of, I actually encourage if any teachers are watching, like, you know, sometimes teachers, they want to make sure students are, oh, I just want students to love me and I want to be their friends and I want to tell them the art is so good, the art is so good because I want to lift them up. That's great. But maybe that's something their parents can do as well. I think <laughs> a lot of times the teachers uh, <laughs> be that boss that uh, symbolically that this the, the talented student is going to face. And because of that boss, they're going to lose their career and their job. So um, I people who later on in the industry work with me, some of my students, they're like, Cad, like you are so different than the teacher. And I was like, exactly. I wanted you to be the warrior. So now that you're here, we can have tea together and have fun, right? And I mean, by fun professional, you know, like, but I, I just say always, um, these are, this is so important that I wish they would teach more at schools that, uh, again, uh, exp like educate yourself about the business aspects of it, but also about uh, the etiquette of, you know, they call it networking, but networking is not you just reach out to someone just anyhow. Um, but also I would say reach out to many people like us. And a lot of times the young people ask people like us, like, oh, how did you get here? And we talk about all the sweet things. One of the good questions to ask your the people that you admire in the industry is, can you share with me the challenges? Can you tell me at what point you were so close to getting fired? Ask this to those people who made it and learn from what they tell you. And so, yeah, that's what I would tell myself. Those are really great things to point out. And I feel like there are, there are, there should be like an addendum to college or wherever, whatever yeah. school you're going to that's yeah. that, or that's like the practical knowledge, like, like knowing how to take notes is so important. And that's yeah. something they don't teach you at all, or at least they didn't teach me. And like, you know, there's a notes etiquette or, you know, there's room etiquette. There's all this stuff that is like super useful that they don't really prepare you for. Absolutely. I mean, I think yeah, in addition to, go ahead. No, no, Alice, go. No, nope, you go. Oh, no. I mean, I just, I was just going to, because Christine kind of made me think like taking notes, so important, like giving notes. Like that was something that, you know, in a pr position of privilege, like when you're uh, head of the creative team, it's like you need to be really sensitive about giving notes to, to artists, but like your equals, your writer, like, like it's just and there are very specific ways to do it um you know kind of balancing uh honesty with with like tact like sometimes it needs to be a question not you know i think this doesn't work or you right. know it's things like that that i thought that i was pretty tactful but there's still so many there are just so many um just tact I, I i just like strategies i guess that you learn um once you work mm -hmm. once you work in a team uh, Go ahead, Bobby. No, no, no I, was, I was just going to say, I talked to, um, like, randomly, I had, like, a, like a talk with Brie Henderson, and I know Amanda, and uh, um, Brie was, like, a, I mean, she had nothing but great things to say about you as a director. So I'm wondering, like, what kinds of things, like, you know, just kind of, like, how you work, um, not work the room, that sounds crazy, I like, like, how you, like, work of work with the biz ed room the story room that kind of thing so everybody kind of feels like they know what's going on and then also they get to know that kind of stuff as a director yeah I love Brie and Amanda oh my gosh yeah no they're so wonderful I think it's like just being really grounded you know and I think it, it has to come from a place of like humility too that like your artists know what they're doing, <laughs> you know, like, like it's a balance between trusting them to know what they're doing, but also you, you know, uh, I remember my manager told me this great uh, kind of description of what a director is. And it's that you're just trying to bring the best out of everyone. Like you're not, you're not supposed to be the best artist or you're not supposed to be the best story artist, even if you are, like, that's not your, your particular job. Like you're bringing 
the best skills, like the best talent and passion out of your entire team to create something that's cohesive. So when I feel like at least when I try to go into a room, I'm like, I have like a very high view of everything. Like I know what the story is. I know what the art is. I, the note that I'm giving oftentimes is how do we stay cohesive to the entire movie? Like it, it's almost always a great design. Like that's why we hired you. But like it might not fit into the themes of what we're trying to say. Like, oh, you, we might be, you know, not really following the style guide that we had, um, we had set. And, you know, I think it's always really helpful to be positive first and be like, I really appreciate this. And, and also be really honest when it is something you asked for. <laughs> Like, like if I did ask for something, I'd be like, oh, I did ask for that. Thank you so much. It's really great to see it. But now, actually, I, I think, you know, I think we should go in this other direction. I'd be really, uh, you know, I'd really appreciate it. Um, and sometimes it is admitting that this, you know, you made not the wrong call, but it's almost like, hey, like, I wanted to see this option. Now we're going in a different direction. And I think that that honesty is nice. And I think it's, I think um, a lot of the advice I've gotten from people I really respect when it comes to like first time directing or something is like, just ask questions and don't let it be about ego. I think th there's this weird thing where if you're just starting out, you almost like want to be more protective because you kind of don't want to admit that you don't know a lot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, so it's like, oh my gosh, right. like you want to go into the room and be like, you know, I know I want this or <laughs> whatever, but, right. but it's like, people can sniff it out like really easily. So kind of leaning into humility and, but, but at the same time, like firm, firm decisions with like tactful language. That's always really, really helpful. That's awesome. Um, I, I want to get um, Victoria on the, um, on the call because she asked a question. Hi, Victoria. Hello. 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 Sorry. Hello. And, and sorry, if you guys have any other questions, it, it really helps. Uh, I, I think at this point to uh, just like put your name and we can like put you on live because um, uh, there's a lot to read in like I said but like if you guys want to ask a question um, we can put that out. Go ahead Victoria take it away sorry. I just want to say like thank you so much to all these like Asian queens here and also like just everyone being here sharing and being personal about like their stories and also as someone who's a Vietnamese American I really like um, touch me and makes me keep on going in animation. Oh yeah, so basically one of the questions I have is like, I hear that a lot of um, portfolios for like storyboarding, for example, like sharing your own personal stories is really important. But I was wondering if anyone had an idea of how I could also share my own personal stories through like character designs. Um, I, I, I want to just uh, say this, uh, you know, a um, lot of people think like I've, I've seen in a lot of like, let's say portfolios or people who want to share their character design that uh, they do a lot of just characters, you know, and they care about just the anatomy, which is important and the characters just looking at the camera, let's say, or the turnaround. Uh, I think one of the things personally me I always look when we're searching for character designers is what stories they tell. So, you know, through that one image, uh, if you make one character interact with another character or another object and really show their emotions and how they feel, you share a story. So I say in character design, if you create moments, the the, the pockets, I say, that reflects, let's say, a pain that you face, that the, mo the moment that you felt so joy like joyful, if you hugged someone or you ate like a yummy food, or whatever those moments are that shows who Victoria is, it shares the story of who you are and makes it authentic. So actually character design can be very transparent and, and, and is a form of storytelling if you allow it to be and not just look at it as characters, just stiff, you know, uh, again, moving around. Again, that side of a character design is important too when you're in production to do turnarounds and all that. But I really encourage, uh, you know, uh, everyone in, let's say their portfolios, if they want to get in to tell stories that they're almost like if they're short moments uh, in character designs. So that's how, in my opinion, you can bring the pieces of yourself into your designs. Yeah, I wanted to share kind of a snippet as well. Thank you, Kat. Like, 
So definitely like those moments so important. I think there's another side of it that I'm experiencing too, which is that we're designing um, Asian characters in the story that's inspired by the Cinderella stepsisters. They're actually Asian immigrants. And, and you'd be surprised, like, especially if you're designing kind of people of color, how much hasn't been represented on screen. And like, you know, we're going into 3D, but even in 2D, like, especially going to 3D though, like <laughs> I realized that they, you know, I think 3D designs haven't truly paid attention to the design of Asian eyes, like that there's still so much to be done with like making sure you're representing all the types, you know, like correctly, or just at, even just representing them at all, like a monolid or like a hooded lid or like double eyelid, like things like that, I think has, haven't really been explored in, in 3D animation, especially. And so it could be, you know, taking life experiences, but it can be like features that you don't even question sometimes because you see them on screen, but is that truly how you want to be represented? Is there something else, like something else you feel like is missing in character design, you can bring that. And I think people would see it. Right, thank you so much for like um, all the answer that you gave. And yeah, like thinking about like the moments, like for especially to me, I feel like uh, if I saw that in a portfolio and seen like, oh, like, oh, hugging someone, like, I feel like that would warm my heart and really like touch me as well. Absolutely. And we all see that as well. So just create also those moments that you want to see, because if you feel it, we feel it. And um, that's when magic happens. All right. Thank you so much. Thanks, Victoria. Um, Janine? If you're there, you can come on and turn your camera on. Or if not, you can just like, there you are. Hi. Hi, hello. Hi, nice to meet all of you. Hi, hello. I'm so honored to participate in, in this uh, panel. This is amazing. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, awesome. I mean, uh, yeah, I wasn't sure. Okay, go ahead. It's off to you. Ask your question. <laughs> Actually, I had to leave the, the Zoom chat, so it, it deleted for a second. So oh, yeah, I'm kind of just going to make this up from what I remember Isn't my question good. was. Um, so I landed in an, uh, an art director position pretty early in my career. And one of the things that I'm experiencing now is kind of what you're talking about is um, like imposter syndrome. You know, you feel... Uh, inadequate sometimes when you're in the room like how do you combat this and I, I know you touched uh, on, on this a bit uh, but how do you as being like one of the on, only Asian women in the room how do you combat uh, that feeling of inadequacy sometimes I feel like I mean to be super honest there's a part of it that doesn't quite go away <laughs> but that it gets better and that you get more confidence as time goes on. I think that it's tough because as important as it is for um, like, obviously this diversity push is amazing, but the truth is there's also that part of some people's brain that are going to think like this person is here because they're diverse. And you just have to know that like you're talented and diverse is like, second or third <laughs> in what, like you're bringing a unique voice, you're there because they need you and like they need your voice and you're bringing something, you know, special to the table. And yeah, I don't know, I feel like it'll, it'll get better and it's getting better, so <laughs> yeah. Thank you, I appreciate that, yeah. I you know, sometimes it, it kind of hits me when I'm giving notes to people who are probably in the industry way longer than me. And, and I always have to stop and think of, you know, are they, are they going to respect my note? Are they going to, you know, behind the scenes, like, oh, she doesn't know what she's talking about. Um, so that's kind of like, what's always clouding me. I know, I know it'll get better with experience, but I appreciate well, your answer. <laughs> well, I mean, that's a, that's a good question to, I'll throw out to the panelists. And thank you for that, um, Janine, of like, how do you, how do you, whether like you coming in, you're a newcomer and you're giving notes to like a, you know, like senior people and that kind of stuff. You know, I, I understand what you're saying, Janine, but 
it shouldn't be that way, right? <laughs> I mean, like it, it really, so how do you, how do you guys kind of overcome that sort of dichotomy of just you being new, but you being in a leadership position? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, I think that's a really worthwhile conversation because despite our titles, I think everyone here realized, like, we all know that the struggle has, hasn't ended or anything, you know, it's like, we are still women of color in these positions. And that's a great question, Janine, like, it's a continuing feeling. And, and, you know, I love my team. Uh, but it, it's like interacting with almost, there are a lot of other people you could interact with that might give you the feeling that like, oh, you know, they don't think you paid your dues or they don't respect you or they just don't like trust you, you know, because you haven't like proven yourself, like you haven't truly proven yourself. To me, like what I try to do is be the person that knows the project best. <laughs> like in the end, it's like you can compare like experience on paper and all that stuff, but like you have the highest vantage point. You have that vantage point that will allow you to give the note that is best for your story and your film, your project or show, you know, and that knowledge is kind of incomparable. Like you can't, you, you know, it's hard to say that an individual artist would be able to know that more than you. Like you, you have put in that work, you know, you do put in the work every single day. And so I try to remember that. That's amazing advice. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. And then something that in another, I mean, like a bunch of other Asian writer group things, um, something else that someone else has said that sticks with me is like, sometimes if you're feeling that way, ask yourself, would a white guy feel the same? <laughs> and the answer is sometimes, usually no. <laughs> and like, yeah. <laughs> Fair enough. That's a great way to look at it. <laughs> Um, I, I want to just like uh, quickly say, um, you know, no matter how much we try to like get to a point that, uh, you know, everything's uh, in a way equal, I think um, another side and something else is going to happen that is going to disappoint us also just knowing that there is an unfortunate reality here, not to again, to accept it, but not, I remember when I faced this challenge uh, that it is not about the lack of knowledge, it's just about, you know, being, let's say, a certain ethnicity and, you know, as a woman and, you know, just come in like, uh, some people, um, believe it or not, some other, some other women, like this is not just all like men like sometimes you see with other women you don't uh, get that level of let's say respect and um i remember uh, like earlier it, these things used to affect me a lot and in a way i was like uh there was like an incident that uh if if i would raise up my voice i mean meaning like share my opinion uh you know, one person would get up and leave, you know, always in the room. So, uh, and I actually was like, okay, so I'm not going to talk anymore. You know, I'm not going to like share my opinion in that room. And, and, uh, and then I realized that person can get up and leave if they want to, you know, and uh, if, you know, the, you're working with someone that uh, no matter what, they don't uh, respect you, you know, you can try, but they, we get to a point that sometimes we can't force someone to respect us, right? To see us as, as the equals. But I also want to say this, this is a little bit touchy. So I want to say this because I have heard this from a lot of um, white colleagues uh, that I admire. And I want to share this. I always believe uh, if we go to extreme any direction, it can lead to a lot of problems. So as a minority woman who I want to support everyone, you know, all minorities to finally be able to have a voice. 
if we let's say say okay so if you're let's say nowadays even the companies they discuss oh if you let's say an older white man no we want to bring and i think if we also go too extreme that route we create such division so to me is can we learn from the experience and bring the youth can we bring that sort of us ourselves when we get the platform how do we create that um balance in a way because you know it it, it is a very tough act so um it is, I just say we don't have all the answers now. And uh, I don't know if anyone understood what I was saying, but no, I just, you know, I, I, I know that uh, I, I just don't want us to also be an extreme way that uh, then we create more division, if that makes any sense. You know, we need to, again, uh, work again as allies um, and um, yeah I always say the one thing they say about America is like it's a salad bowl right so we need to create and, and I admire that so I think we need to have that salad bowl in the industry leadership all around you know so so profound yeah. I love that. <laughs> yeah I definitely agree kind of like taking the high road right it's like we we go we go high kind of thing it's like I'm I'm lucky to have a sort of um majority female team right now but I also pay attention to make sure the men on our team don't feel like left out or you know or you know in any sense like similar similarly to how I felt in the past and like male-dominated workspaces right. that that is not something that I want to keep or you know maintain as part of just any any workplace culture and 100%. and so really you know bringing that empathy knowing how we have been marginalized and then making sure that we like squash it that is a wonderful position to be in and I think that you know honestly that is probably one of the biggest um positives to come out of you know just like trusting and hiring uh women of color, especially as, as creatives, you know, just people of color in general, marginalized, just, you know, underrepresented groups is that there is maybe that like higher level of understanding of like, of, of empathy, because we have felt the, the negative impact of like an unempathetic world. Right. Yeah. Um, Monsi, um, do you want to bring on, do we want to bring on Mono for the last discussion? Mano, are you still there? Sorry, we can't Yes, so much, everyone. Hi, Mano. Hello. Hey. Hi. Hi, everyone. Um, this was a really great session. <laughs> so thank you so much for your time. No problem. Um, yeah, so I'm actually from Montreal, Canada. And I as well, I am not trained in um, animation. I'm a nurse, actually, in terms of profession. Um, just like how many of you express, um, I always had uh, a strong passion for the arts. Like, and at one point in my education, I had to choose which way to go, especially the way things are uh, structured here in, in our education system. And I took the practical route in terms of the Asian approved route, um, because I am first generation Canadian and I had to do it for financial reasons and to help the family and so on. But obviously, I love the art so much. I used to draw, you know, little stories and design my own little booklets. I still have them <laughs> uh, from like sixth grade, fourth grade. And I still cannot stop thinking about it. It's kind of like, like what Alice said. If, if it means so much, you can never shut it out, right? It'll come back somehow. Oh, and Sorry, really, Mono, really quickly. Um, before I forget, can you tell them about... All, before all this is over, about your hospital, like, story trip? Oh. <laughs> all right, go ahead. Like, Mano you was one of it. my mentees before. Yeah. You know, so she's got to tell you about this. was my mentor. Yeah, I remember yeah, yeah. telling you. You still remembered. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Anyway, so, go ahead. Keep going. Sorry, sorry. Yeah, sorry. so basically, um, that's because of that little voice is what made me, um, in 2018, go about finding animators to work on because I had a really, like, a strong story in mind that I wanted to bring to life but obviously I'm not trained in it but 
um, given my profession, I know how to lead, I know how to work with a team, you know, you have your skill set that comes in handy, right? So you had to use what you have. Um, and I guess I'm very good at persuading people. So I got three animators uh, who worked on like Stranger Things and I forget the other projects that they, they worked on. So many, very talented being, very humble to on board to work with my story. And we're working on it. We're doing this on the side of our full-time jobs, obviously. And me at the time when I started this, I was in the hospital. So <laughs> I would reserve the uh, the conference room with my, my ID and everything as the nurse. And this is part of our research and training conference rooms. And um, they would always ask, why do you need it? Why do you need it? Why do you always need this conference room at 7 p.m.? You know, and then I always book at 7 p.m. So there's never any conflict in snuggling my animator team into the room. So they would come and, you know, I would have to get each let each of them into the conference room so you see this girl this scrubs and a bunch of these completely random individuals just being sn uh, snuck into a conference room where they do not believe, belong in it's in a hospital too so and they always get lost too so I had to go and get them from the entrance and then sneak them in so it was a struggle and then in the in the conference room you'll just see like storyboards <laughs> You know, so people from the outside, there's like a little panel window, they can see what you're doing. They're probably thinking it's like a research project or something, but, but it's not, obviously. Um, yeah, so that was part of the struggle, my struggle, in terms of making things happen, because, you know, we need Wi-Fi, and I didn't know where else to supply them Wi-Fi with. So, yeah, um, but my question is, um, as a new director, when you guys started off, as a director with your first film, what was one thing that you wish you did differently? Or not even one thing, like some things that you wish that you did differently or that you knew at least, you know, for the future. Um, and my second question was for someone like me coming from a different uh, field. Um, I know you guys went uh, on to pursue art school, but is there a way for someone like me to go a different angle in terms of entering the animation uh, film, especially if I want to be a like, director, storyteller. I know it's about gaining experience and everything, but even for an internship position, it's so hard to get in when you're not in that umbrella. So that was my two-part question. Thank you again. Uh, I can answer the second one, but if, uh, if anyone wanted to jump in for the, the first. Okay, I'll, I'll go ahead. I'll, um, so something that was helpful for me was, you know, I, I can relate to the kind of uh, career switch part of it um, because I feel like, you know, because of the responsibility that I felt to my family, you know, um, I wanted, it was important to me to become financially independent, but, but you know, for, for a while I had, I worked in a lot of different uh, fields, like design related fields. So I did architecture, yes, but also graphic design. Um, I worked in tech for a while. I, I was in animation for VR. I did like photography for a little bit, like all these different things. And, and I was actually in 3D, like I was an animator, 3D animator for a while. So I was more in the, on the um, kind of production technical side of animation. Uh, and what was helpful was that I could, you know, I kept on wanting to do that because I needed to be able to financially support myself while I was also pursuing animation. And that is extremely understandable and it's like a very practical thing to do. When I actually started making true strides though, was actually when I made the leap to focus the most on what I wanted to do. And that is like scary, <laughs> like that's, that's scary. But it, what was helpful to me was kind of giving myself a time frame. Like I have this amount of money saved up. I'm gonna give myself like a full year. Even if I'm like not working, like I would just focus on, on um, writing, pitching, like this would be my primary thing. And, um, you know, I actually tried it a few times and the first time it failed because I didn't have enough confidence to sustain it. <laughs> and so I needed to get a job, but then um, it almost to kind of like replenish my, my sense of self-worth. <laughs> but I think after trying it and becoming a bit more confident, that was when things really started happening for me. And I, I can't say it would for, you know, just uh, this is just my own experience, but there's something to be said about just the, the commitment like we like jumping in um i want to answer both of your um questions so you know the first one uh, i want to say this uh, i again your story is so unique uh, and you know it, it, i i think it's something that just keep in mind there's such truth but also 
uh, entertainment to it that uh, it is so valuable to even be watched as some sort. So I just want to say that. Um, uh, I, I want to say you already experienced a little sense of team. So what I want to share is, you know, as, as a director, just putting the team together. Uh, one thing um, I, you know, I, I tell myself or all the young directors, you know, who get that chance is take that role really seriously. One thing sometimes it happens again, uh, some uh, younger directors, you know, or newcomers, they, they go the safe route, they just call their friends and bring everybody together. And, and, and that's great too if you know them, but, um, or sometimes you just only hear from others that, oh, that person has a name, that person has a name and you put them together. If in your team, uh, there is a bad apple, and, and I say this because I've worked in teams that there are bad apples, the whole ship will sink. No matter how great you are in the story, the team will collapse. So as a director, there is it's there is a lot of responsibilities as, as a leader. Uh, you know, it's like a, you have the whole orchestra, like, right? So you, uh, like one thing is to, again, know the story and make sure that art, everything's going well. But the other thing is you need to really uh, know what kind of people you put together, how they can impact each other. So I think uh, even your team was small, Mono, like I really feel like if you want, let's say, to make your project become something, uh, not only look at skill level, Look at how they work together. Do they lift each other up? Do they complement one another? Do they bring more ideas that can be inspiring to the other? If one is going down, can the other one lift the other up? So these are like you're watching and you're the one who are creating this, right? Uh, uh, this moment too. Your uh, second question, which is a very important question. Um, I say, you know, I, um, one thing I wish about this country, uh, it has so many wonderful things, but we need to have healthcare and education for free, but we're not there yet. Uh, so even I, I went to art school, I have to pay student loans forever. Uh, well, we'll see. So I say, uh, you know, th the good news is, yes, you don't necessarily need to have that art background necessarily to really make it in the industry but your question is how how do we pivot that and come in and i say you already did it if you have a story idea and you don't know how to draw right and you don't know how to bring it finding the team and bring them together but one thing i tell you is this i know this all of you so this is for you and everyone uh you must sign something with them. I'm not kidding you. It doesn't matter if it's like, I mean, listen, if it's like your brother and sister, maybe it's like a little different thing, but I'm really serious. I, I, this, this was my problem that if you don't have an agreement with people who come on a team early on, right? And then later on, like you hire like a couple of people like from here and there and they help you. They're like, we love you. We believe in you. Like, thank you. And then you go pitch it, let's say to Disney Netflix and they make it and they make you a director. There can be a lot of conflicts down the line come if those agreements are not there. So I say the way for you to make it in the industry. And by that, I assume you're talking about make your story be heard. Am I understanding this correctly? I say, yes, absolutely. Yes. find the team, you know, and you can find, uh, I say, uh, open doors for students as well. Go to schools and, and reach out to the deans and say, uh, you know, some students are will. I mean, I say the students need to get paid, but uh, sometimes if they believe in a project, you can be like, you can be attached to it, you know, and you get this credit for your thing. So I, uh, but make something together, then you can come pitch it before you pitch it copyright it this is so important and then you come pitch it to uh the companies and also i say uh th this is an another story but a lot of companies they say if you have an agent or like a manager they take you more seriously that's another thing some people is like well how, how do i find that right 
what's important is the the copyright system is so important like guys if you don't know about copywriting your thing it's a very simple thing but again they don't teach you this at school so protect uh your ideas and uh yeah so did i answer your question i hope i gave yes you uh, actually you you just, you just hit it on the nail <laughs> like it was perfect thank you both um it was very insightful and I definitely agree to copyright because of my science background. Um, I do think of all these things because in research, everything has to be about your, your, your it has to go through ethics approval and there's so many legalities, right? Exactly. So because of that uh, knowledge, I always figured, okay, I have to probably protect work. So I am in the works of going through uh, legal just to protect my stuff, but Canadian copyright laws are very flaky. Uh, I don't know how it is in the States. Um, Copyright.org, again, they are also could be, but there are some simple steps you can take, you know, to mm -hmm. prove. But again, we can't fully protect everything, but at least take no. the steps you can take to protect that. Yeah. And I'm really serious that even you have a small team, if it's just the word of mouth, hey, can you do this for me as a favor, do this as a favor. If your idea that I really in my heart, I believe it's going to be a big idea, make sure Thank that, you. <laughs> that you bring on like you are like treated as you are a professional director and you don't just mm -hmm. say, hey, can you do this? Can you do that? No say, hey, there's this, you know, like a little agreement, little agreement, and it's something. Again, um, this could be a good test for the future as well. Yeah, I did learn a lot. Um, I've been doing this since 2018. It's like, it's hard to commit full time, but um, I think maturity also helps when it comes to this yeah. role as well. I don't think I could see myself doing this 10 years ago. Um, I definitely learned a lot from my own profession. Maybe this is why I was destined to go this route. I don't know. But um, because of that, I felt that I was able to be a better leader. I, it's kind of like what you said, pick the bad apples. I didn't have a bad apple yet, not kind of wood, but I did have a poorly committed apple. <laughs> so um, I made it very clear, like, listen, I cannot pay you. This is from full on vol voluntary. Um, but the, I made everything very clear as, you know, water. So the people who are still with me, they're full on, um, which I'm so grateful for. Uh, but that one bad apple that I poorly judge, but I guess it happens, but uh, it happens. Yeah. But again, be, I mean, everyone should be aware of it. And that's great that you already experienced. And I want to also say to all the healthcare workers, including yourself, you guys Thank you are so much. The true heroes that, I mean, everybody knows this. So bravo Thank you so much. What you do and, and truly. So um, we're well, this project is keeping me sane. So, so far, so good. Yes. Thank you so much. Thank you. I think you're oh, muted, you're Bobby. You're muted, Bobby. <laughs> That's what I always do. Um, so we can we can call it like a thing if you guys have to go. We're kind of like an hour and a half over, but we can take one more if you guys want. And then if you have to head out, then um, we can head out. Um, but Tiffany, you are you there? Ish. Oh wait, don't didn't allow you to talk yet and be a panelist and then so tiffany can be our like finale <laughs> <laughs> just to respect you guys so. hi hi tiffany oh, sorry Hello. i did not expect this i did not know that i was going to be i thought this was over i'm not ready <laughs> um <laughs> <laughs> wow <got> this <laughs> this has been an absolutely beautiful webinar i just finished wiping my tears before i turned on my camera but um i appreciate all of you so 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 much um and I just like, I just, I love what everybody has to say, but I want to give a special thanks to Kat because I am, I know a lot of uh, recent graduates are going through a tough time right now. And I just, I didn't even know if I wanted to click this webinar because I was like, I've, I've watched so many and I've gotten all this good advice, but I just feel like I'm going nowhere. So I just like really appreciate, you know, the, the moral encouragement, even, you know, we don't know each other personally. I feel like I've really connected with, you know, what everybody has to say. So I, I really, really appreciate that. Like I, I have a hope now, that's all. Um, my question was a little bit technical, I guess. Um, it seems like you're all writers. So I was just wondering if the path to becoming 
a director is linear like you have to get you have to become a writer and then move up that way or can you start from I'm not a writer production oh can you start I'm from production or either. recruiting or anywhere else uh I'm only a writer not a director <laughs> <laughs> uh, Christine do you want to go first oh but I only I am just a writer not a director but I my path was pretty linear in that I started as an intern and then became a an assistant and then a script coordinator and then went to writing from there. But um, Mono's story made me think of how many, like that's people come into this from all walks of life. One of my, one of the most successful writers I knew was a plumber and then um, went into the Nick Fellowship and is now like, you know, super successful. I think that your experiences can like, can help you just, you know, whatever you decide to get into um but yeah I don't know if <laughs> that answers your question that is actually I mean I, I want to know that writer actually tell us who that's a great story who was a plumber before um I I, I say this um you know, uh, one thing, uh, there's no, uh, in my opinion, there's no rule. No, the answer to it is not. But, uh, you know, I, I would say if you have a certain experience, right, and, and let's say got your hands dirty in some ways, played in the mud, it, it, it helps you become a director, not just to become, but to hold that position and hopefully thrive. I, I say one of the things I've done that, uh, I personally don't know many uh, colleagues of my mine who've tried it that goes read like you got to really bring your ego down is this we are very much used to this system of climbing the ladder up right and uh, you know especially as students you you again you go like okay one two three four five and then if there is by any chance you stay in that one ladder for too long it can be a failure etc one thing i've done and it was because of my struggles it was when i you know reached that company dream and i realized that my voice is not being heard that i thought i'm going to come in and, and share all the ideas and, and i can't and and all the other things with life that was happening and i went through that dark time I uh, left the industry for some time, but then when I came back because I had to pay the student loans and all that, and was, you know, and had the opportunities, I brought my position down. Like I went, I went down, right? And to a lot of people, I saw a lot of my colleagues back, like classmates are going up. And I was like, for my sanity, and for me to have a space to think and create my creative work outside of the corporation company, I'll bring my position low. And that, of course, some people, you see disrespect because they look at you like, oh, you have a low position. But let me tell you the luxury that comes with it. Anyone who's listening and you have a low position in the industry, you are, whatever the low is, I, I don't mean it by disrespect. I'm just talking about hierarchy, right? Mm -hmm you are exposed to the truth. The higher you go, oh, everything's beautiful. They talk to you, would you like this? Would you like this? I mean, it's, it's not all butterflies and bunny rabbits, but you don't see the, the dirt under the, the table and on the, under the rug. If you want to thrive as leaders and really become, let's say the CEOs and the best directors, whatever, whoever you want to be, I say symbolically work in the kitchen. So Tiffany, the answer is there is no such a thing. Oh, if you're a coordinator or this, you can't be that. In fact, I encourage you to take those positions. But when you take those positions, don't just, you know, just say, oh, I can't wait to just be there. Keep that focus, but also try to listen because when you're in that position, a lot of directors, like let's say if you're a secretary, if you're a coordinator, the producers come vent in front of you. They tell you about the truth, about the budget, about the this, about everything. The company, you know the company's sinking, right? And everybody on top, they're like, it's beautiful. Everything's fantastic. You know the Titanic hit the iceberg, <laughs> but you know it. But so you learn, okay, how do we solve the issue? So you become a problem solver.
right? So my thing is I absolutely, this is not written, but I say, I encourage if you want to become a stronger leader, work in the kitchen and in the, in the bottom positions, but learn when you have those positions. Yeah, absolutely. That's awesome. I think, you know, uh, just to kind of reiterate, I am also, I'm a director, but also not a writer. And so I feel like my advice would be just to create stuff <laughs> like, like, um, you know, uh, the, the job I have right now, I think has also, it's, you know, I, I kind of described a little bit the untraditional path, um, but it wasn't through kind of working my way up the ladder necessarily. It was, you know, trying for like five, six years of creating work and developing relationships and then eventually. And I think one of the things that really took me um, on an important, basically allowed me to take that step was creating like a web comic that actually uh, got some viewership and um, it allowed me to sell my first um, show to Disney TV that helped me to get my first exposure into developing something. Um, and yeah, and I feel like, you know, whether it's what Mano did with, you know, is doing right now, creating a short film, that was the other thing that helped me a lot. So if you have any sort of standalone work, it can be just a webcomic, you know, like any, anyone can do that on, on Instagram. Um, that, that was really helpful. Uh, and so, you know, I think people in the industry really respect, I think we've all said this like a point of view. And if you have like some kind of package, whatever it is, could be a script, could be a webcomic, could be, you know, a little movie, a short film, they, they get your point of view, like by consuming it. And, and that, that really helps no matter where you're coming from. It doesn't, you don't have to be coming from the same industry. Um, and you don't have to necessarily be working many, many, many years in that industry. So I hope that's helpful. Tiffany, can I ask you a question? Absolutely. What is your uh, dream career? Can you say it to us? <laughs> I, that is a really tough question because as I, as I, I said, um, I just, I'm an undergraduate and I'm, I have a background in illustration. So I have always been an artist since I was a little kid. But like many of you, I told myself I couldn't be an artist. And then I went to pursue it anyway, because I was like, whatever, what can I lose? Um, and I'm learning about all these different terms in animation. So I'm like, I, as of right now, I'm trying to pursue production because I feel like I have leadership skills within me. Um, but then at the same time, I, I still have this artistic fire in me. And some people have told me like, if you go into production, you can't really be artistic. You kind of, you, uh, you know, you're the, you're the manager, you, you, schedule, you schedule things. Um, so I'm trying to like battle should I give up my artistic side and, and be the, a leader or, you know, I'm trying to learn about the industry to see where I actually fit in. Um, I, I, I honestly say, I, I hear when people say that, he, here's the part that what they tell you, that if you go to production, it, it, it's, the, the part is this, if you go to production and the, you lose the sight of the art, meaning like you don't draw anymore on the side and you, you kind of lose that passion because you're in the whole like scheduling or this, whatever that role is. Yes, eventually you step away. But if you go there with the awareness that I am here to help perhaps the artists learn from the directors, work side by side, the producers that is to learn, but you always keep that focus. I actually don't think you're gonna fall off the wagon. So I think the power is in your hand of how much art is important to Tiffany, right? Um, but uh, I mean, I just say, we see you, Tiffany, you are here. And I can't wait for you to thrive in the industry, all of you guys. I can't wait for us to work side by side you and make this industry better. Thank you. Thank you to all the panelists and everybody in the comments. I feel like I just, again, like I was going through this whole like doubt of, I don't know what to do, but I, what I'm hearing from everybody is just like, you know, don't lose where you started from. Don't lose the artistic side of you because, um, you know, you have to be crazy to choose art as a, as a career, you know, <laughs> you have to be passionate and you have to love it. So, you know, if this is what I chose, this is what I want to stick with. And I just have to, you know, follow the path that's ahead. Wherever, wherever that is, whatever that is, whatever it looks like. So thank you to everybody. Thank you, Tiffany. Yeah, no regrets, no regrets. Cause 
yeah, that's what happened to me. Like I went off the path and I'm like, I can't do anything else. <laughs> like, I, I need to go back. <laughs> Thank you all for being here. That's so wonderful. Oh no, she went away. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I guess this should be the time. <laughs> Tiffany, send us off. Uh, I'm just kidding. Um, so uh, just, to respect everyone's time and Katana is all the way in like Culver City or something wherever Netflix is. Um, Burbank I'm, now, I'm in Burbank. No, I'm kidding. Yeah, I know, I knew, I knew. Uh, oh. <laughs> uh, man, thank you so much for being here, everybody. Monty, um, take it away. I don't want to keep Thank talking. you so much for your time, everyone, and for being flexible with your time, because I know we went over by a lot. <laughs> but I, I think we t covered a lot of amazing topics and amazing, um, we talked about struggles and just everything that people typically don't hear. And I'm just glad that we were able to hear your stories. And thank you so much for even accepting to be a part of this. And we're so excited uh, for people to hear more about you. Thanks for thank having you. us. Thank Thanks you so for much. Yeah. Us. Yeah. So thank flattered you to be on the panel with you all. I mean, these Asian queens, I just want to say it's an honor to be next to you guys. So that's... that's You're a queen uh, to your cat. Well, <laughs> I'm take your class. I'm not an artist, but I want to take your class. <laughs> I, I, I want to write writing for you. Yeah, writing. Yes. Yeah, writing is... Yeah. Oh my gosh. I'd be so intimidated to be in a writer's room. Oh my gosh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, but um, I mean, like, I, maybe I would close to just kind of say like what uh, Kat said in the beginning of like, every we, you know, uh, we, we sort of come here trying to present ourselves as panelists as accomplished, but we are not. We struggled like everybody else on this panel and everyone coming behind us. And, um, and yeah. so it's it, like, it's, a, it's, it's just kind of like, we're all in the, kind of in the same boat, right, Kat? I mm -hmm. I can I actually I say a quote? I want to say a quote that, that lifts me up. So to any of you uh, who are listening, exactly to what Bobby said, but I always say this. Yes, we all have struggles, but they thought they could bury us. They didn't know we were seeds. So we all are going to grow. That's what keeps it going, guys. <laughs> Yo. Damn. <laughs> Hell yeah. They right. didn't know. They didn't yeah, there's know. a lot of times it's a flame. It's like, I'm going to prove I'm wrong. You know, all these people yes. who didn't believe, you know, and you all, you know, keep up that passion and you'll, you'll get there. I think that's the, that's the common story that I hear from you guys is of just kind of like your story. It was freaking hard in the beginning, but you guys like found a way to like push past that. So mm -hmm. that's the difference, right? Mm -hmm. You either push past it or give up. Um, anyway, yeah. Cat, amazing. Can you say that one more time? Sorry, and then I'll, I'll hit pop, I'll hit stop right <laughs> at the end. No, I'm just I, I, I just, I just want to say also, um, before I, I say the quote and, and you end it, I say, it's not only others, it's the voice in us who always puts us down too that we got to say, prove that's wrong, right? So on that note, they thought they could bury us. They didn't know we were seeds. Woo! <laughs> awesome. All right, y'all. What a great, what a great quote to end on. Thank you so much, Kat, Alice, Christine, Monsi, uh, Janine Mono Shrav in the uh, background, but uh, thank you guys for coming out. Have a great weekend, you guys. Hope this was inspiring, um, and hope you guys got your one or two vaccinations. So you guys can get out there, but uh, miss y'all, and and we'll we'll see each other again soon. So, thank you guys. Thank you everybody. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Bye, you. everybody. Bye. Take care.